Okay, now uh, let me start off with a uh, brazen appropriation of uh, phrases from two book titles. Uh, I want to embrace the urgency of now, a phrase in fact appropriated by Carrie Di Pietro and Hugh Grady from Martin Luther King. And I want to retain an awareness of my place of reading, a phrase that I'm, well, in fact, partly coining, uh, appropriating from the title of the book by Seamus Heaney. Basically, I want to look into Shakespeare, energized both by a sense of crisis and a perception of my circumstance. Now, my circumstance, let me be facetiously literal about this. Now, uh, when I travel east uh, from the Atlantic Rim on which I am based and relocate for a week to this university city in Shongrad County in the southern Hungarian Great Plain, I'm elated by the evident privilege of my circumstance, the ease with which I've covered a great distance to spend a week in a stimulating and friendly environment funded by an international body. But I'm also challenged by the reverse perspective, a humbling sense of how the ease of my cushioned mobility contrasts with the adversities faced by hundreds of thousands whose forced rather than voluntary mobility has become the most disturbing crisis scenario of our age. And I want to endorse this program's rationale by arguing for the ability of early modern texts, in this case a play by Shakespeare, to provide imaginative and cognitive enablement, to allow us to ponder current crises by a sort of riddle ventriloquism. This involves considering how an early modern English playwright represented human transactions that were then unfolding all around him in his North Atlantic location by displacing them to an elsewhere that was remote in time and place, an ancient world of seaports and trading cities in the eastern Mediterranean, the geographical and economic birthplace of risk, as Richard Halpern has phrased it. The text I want to engage with is Pericles, one of the least enthusiastically discussed of Shakespeare's plays. But I will argue that Shakespeare's relocations uh, of those maritime and commercial dynamics provide present-day audiences with imaginative and expressive footholds by representing personal aspiration and acquisitive desire played out against seascapes that have recently acquired an uncanny topicality. Now, Pericles is punctuated by hazardous sea crossings, real or presumed drownings, quasi-miraculous rescues at sea, and uncertainties of hostility versus hostility, here we go again, in coastal mercantile cities that are explicitly bound to place names from antiquity, Ephesus. Pentapolis, Antioch, Tyre, Tarsus, Mytilene, such place names may carry the imaginative suggestiveness Harley Granville Barker once noted when he remarked that, when he remarked that the place name litanies of Antony and Cleopatra generated a sense of the world's spaciousness. More topically, such ancient locations may have suggested to early modern audiences a long lineage for the voyaging and mercantile concerns of the new economy of exchange. Conversely, present-day audiences may be startled into an awareness of that topography and toponymy as strangely current because of the predicaments that have made them feature on the world's screens and front pages. Ephesus, the ancient city near present-day Seltzuk in Asia Minor in the province of Izmir, is one of the main archaeological attractions in Turkey, for which operators were promising a money-back guarantee for all who were not 100% satisfied. But as widely, as widely reported, its appeal to tourists has sadly suffered from its closeness to one of the most hazardous coastlines in the recent migrant crisis. Even more so for Mytilene on Lesbos, much discussed over the past year for the poignant support that local populations have given to refugees despite their disruptive effect on their main source of income. Seeking in Shakespeare expressive resources for this plight is, of course, not new, as made clear by reports of improvised productions on refugee camps. But rather than chart such initiatives, I want to focus on how the play includes an imagination and rhetoric of disaster associated with the coastlines of antiquity that resonates in the dismal scenario of the recent crisis of human mobility. Now, all of the roots evoked in Pericles concern an area of the world marked by an ambivalence 
that may affect other geoeconomies, but has become starkly evident in the eastern Mediterranean. The same sea that is cuffeted and crisscrossed by affluent tourists from crowded cruise ships to the arts of the super-rich has become a disaster area, featuring the utter disruption of community and family, impossibly risky crossings and mass drownings. This combination in the same space of leisure and disaster, huge wealth and utter dispossession raises ethical perplexities to which I want to allude through two words with an ironical cogency at the intersection of the literal and figurative. Liquidity, its flows, its crises of lack of surplus, and mobility of humans, of assets. Now, the setting of Pericles is both archaized and magnified through an allegorical drift. This seems to have stopped working. Here we go. Yeah, by an allegorical drift by which Gower construes the basin of the Eastern Mediterranean as coextensive with the world since Pericles' careful search is described as unfolding within the far opposing coins which the world together joins. Now, together with the abundant imagery of maritime disaster, this concurs towards the prevalence of pathos in a text insistently marked by the wayward seas, where, when men being there seldom ease, by emotionally charged incidents such as a birth at sea during a storm, followed by an apparent death on board in the sea burial, and by allegorizations, as in Marina's summation of her fate. At the bottom of the slide, born in a tempest when my mother died, this world to me is as a lasting storm. Some of the tropes in Pericles that resonate with current perceptions involve long-standing commonplaces with a striking longevity. In Equans in Four, Pericles, on his arrival in the famine-stricken city of Tarsus, addresses the governor and reassures him about his intentions. The dynamics of the scene hinge on the long historical perception shared by early modern audiences that seaborne arrivals often involved predatory violence, plunder, rape, enslavement. Hence, the assurance given by Pericles that, on the contrary, his ships bring relief to the starving city. And he adds, And these are ships you happily may think are like the Trojan horse was stuffed within, with bloody veins expecting overthrow, are stored with corn to make your needy bread, and give them life, whom hunger starved half dead. Now, through one of the most ancient of tropes, Pericles acknowledges the fears of those starving in Tarsus, and stresses that he and his companions are not the Homeric Trojan horse. The cultural conditions under which this statement can be received today, however, include conspicuous uses of that particular image to represent an antithetical situation, the fears of intrusion and disruption entertained by much more prosperous communities wanting to wall themselves against the arrival of starvelings from the sea asking for their food. The trope has been explicitly used uh, by proponents of a fortress Europe or fortress America attitude towards the feared encroachments of migrants. An article entitled The Trojan Horse of Refugees in Europe, posted in early February 2016 on the online journal New Eastern Outlook, apparently published and maintained by the Institute of Oriental Studies of the Russian Academy of Sciences, argued that, and I quote, Countries either have to relinquish some of their universal values by disregarding some of the recognized human rights and freedoms, or the clashes between the two cultures will progress to tragic atrocities, unquote. Across the Atlantic, on a variety of occasions from late 2015 to the present, Donald Trump concurred, declaring that Syrian refugees accepted for asylum in America were a Trojan horse, and arguing for the containment of refugees on Syrian territory that, according to him, could be bought for the purpose. And the trope has been applied to the migrant and refugee phenomenon widely across the blogosphere. Now, of course, the language and incidents of romance, their sense of the archaic enhanced by the Dagawa choruses, prevail in Pericles. And this would seem to be at odds with an emphasis on materially grounded yearnings and suspicions. Romance is suspended, however, to allow material concerns and pointedly money to take a center stage position in a couple of scenes in Act 4. Uh, that contrasts starkly with the rest of the play, since these are the notorious Mytilene brothel scenes. 
The transactions that occupy the three pimps offer a risible and brutal epitome of the dynamics of the proto-capitalist western urban space, even if nominally dislocated to the shores of Asia Minor. Hard-nosed business defines the dialogue of panda, bored, and bolt, marked out by its body prose from the blank verse of other scenes and the rhyme tetrameters of the Gower choruses. Panda's initial injunction, search the market narrowly, uh, still employs the word market in its physical, topographical sense. But the remark that follows, we lost too much money this month, already inflects the synonym towards a measure of abstraction, closer to that present-day usage we recognize in instructions to study the market or compare the market. The boisterous laughter prompted by the low-life scene is qualified, starkly qualified, for present-day audiences by the fact that their trade is in human flesh. Deathly venereal, venereal disease is bluntly acknowledged Sorry, it's the next slide. Bluntly acknowledged um, uh, and found to victimize foreigners before the age of sexual tourism by reifying them as dead flesh. The poor Transylvanian is dead that lay with the little baggage. She made him roast meat for worms. The precariousness of such business may incidentally be represented in terms that evoke the place prevalent seafaring dangers. The stuff we have a strong wind will blow it to pieces. But the language of trade and money punctuates the dialogue with mock seriousness, as the panda philosophizes that our credit comes not in like the commodity, nor the commodity wages not with the danger. Bold by Marina off from the pirates, a case of ancient human trafficking, and this bit of business is also enveloped in the practices and language of professional traders. Marina's arrival signals the irreconcilable nature of the romance and satirical strands in Pericles. The first textual marker of this intractability is the couplet that Marina sets up against the body and monetarized prose of 4-2, binding through rhyme an image of her defining marine origin with a vow of impregnable chastity. If fires be hot, knives sharp, or waters deep, and try thy still my virgin knot will keep. This assertion of essential worth trumps the contingencies of the market as verbalized in the brothel, laughably through the pimp's inaptness. And yet Marina's success in keeping herself out of the sex market and its inexorable exchange nexus involves triumphing over the lust of distinguished customers, who describe with risible religious fervor how she converts them. I am for no more body houses. Shells go here, the vassals sing, and indeed represent their conversion as a case of cancelling the mobility of desire. I am out of the road of rutting forever. Now, Marina's ultimate triumph over the mobility of lust, however, coincides with her encounter with the governor of Mytilene himself. Lysimachus initially seems to dismiss her beauty in a casual-sounding remark that evokes the undiscriminating lust of sailors. She would serve after a long voyage at sea. Lysimachus inquires in succession after her trade, her profession, her condition as a gamester and creature of sale, but their dialogue evolves from this prose proper to a trading relation to the verse that the play's decorum associates with heightened values and indeed with the gold with which the governor ultimately rewards her condition as a piece of virtue. Towards the end uh, of the scene, the conditions unfold towards a convergence of characters for a recognition episode that, after a plot structured by voyages from born to born, region to region, the previous Gower chorus had pointed towards with the closing line, and think you now are all in Mytilene. The final act by opening with a sailor from Tyre meeting one from Mytilene, reminds audiences that this convergence onto a today notorious seaport on Lesbos involves yet another sea crossing, but one that sees Pericles immobilized by grief at the supposed deaths of wife and daughter. Pericles is rescued from stasis and stupor into the interpersonal... Um, Sorry, into the interpersonal um, 
dynamics of discourse and the mobility of normal living through the agency of a daughter born at sea and named after that accident, brought from Tarsus to Lesbos by pirates and hence found at sea again, that closing line there. Her consequence on Pericles during the recognition scene is duly troped in maritime terms. This great sea of joy is rushing upon me, third line there. Uh, threatening to overbear the shores of my mortality, fourth line, and drown me with their sweetness. The Ephesus of Pericles allows for utter bliss to be promised to all characters. Family reunion after another sea crossing with the characters ready to take yet again to the liquid element across their world in the eastern Mediterranean, to Pentapolis for the wedding of Marina and Lysimachus, who will then sail on to Tyre where they will reign. However, and this is a major perplexity, the chain that leads to Pericles' happy ending of unqualified romance crucially includes the play's only spot where People and goods, people as goods, are brutally inserted in a mock replica of the proto-capitalist nexus of mobility and exchange, the Mytilene brothel. This microcosm for continual action, a phrase from the play, plays a crucial role in determining the happy ending. It is because she is brought as a saleable asset to the Mytilin market and faces the challenge posed by the brothel that Marina has to excel in her proselytism of virtue. It is because the virgin lives in the brothel that Lysimachus, who graduates from whoremonger to Prince Charming, meets her and is captivated by her. It is because she threatens the pimps with ruin that Marina is allowed to reveal her exalted talents to all the worthies of Mytilene and be judged the mythical wise virgin who can cure a king, and hence the recognition and reunion scenes on board Pericles' ship and in Ephesus. Forms of mobility that ostensibly or more critically hinge on monetary dynamics prove decisive for characters to see their desires gratified, and this in the liquid element, and in settings that today are the unlikeliest venues to offer happy endings to those that land on their shores. An awareness of such perplexities does not cancel, however, the ability of such a play to make us ponder and express the dismal geopolitics of our age. Even if, in their final blissful scenes, the visitors or denizens of Ephesus would surely be enough, like today's satisfied tourists, not to claim their money back. Thank you.